Wonderful. Well, welcome. Thank you all for coming to our event tonight. My name is Dr. Brian Henning. I am a professor of philosophy and environmental studies, and I direct our Center for Climate Society in the Environment, which just started last April, and we're very uh, glad to be able to co-sponsor this event tonight. Uh, I just wanted to mention before we get started that we have another uh, event coming up next week and a few more uh, later in the month. Uh, in particular, we're excited about this event next Thursday uh, with the uh, author of Braiding Sweetgrass. Really exciting event uh, that will be on Zoom, free and open to the public, so consider registering for that event. You can go, if you're online tonight, you can go to gonzaga.edu slash climate center events and find that full list of programs there. Uh, and now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Greg Gordon, who is the Chair of Environmental Studies and Sciences here at Gonzaga. Dr. Gordon. Thank you. Um, so just to let you know, another event coming up tomorrow, also focused on climate change, Nick Estes, uh, an indigenous scholar talking about climate justice, and that is also in Hemmingson at 6.30. Um, in the ballroom and available uh, virtually as well. So we have uh, some sponsors of this event, the Environmental Studies Department, uh, the Climate Center, and the Faculty Speaker Series. So we'd like to thank all of our sponsors for bringing Dr. Jonathan Koop here. Um, and let's see, I had wrote some notes, but maybe I'll wing it. Um, first off, if People that are on live stream have questions during the presentation. I think what we can do is you can email me and I'll check my phone and then pull those questions up for later at the presentation. So if you have questions during the presentation, just email me. That's Gordon G at Gonzaga.edu, G-O-R-D-O-N-G, Gonzaga.edu, and then I'll sort of um, pull those questions up. This is actually, um, I have particular pleasure in this um, because I've never been able to introduce Jonathan Coop before, I think. Um, and a little background, I first met Jonathan when he was an undergraduate student on a field studies course that I was teaching back in 1994, which gives you an idea of how old I am. Um, and a few years later, uh, the next year, Jonathan graduated with a degree in um, biology from UC Santa Cruz. And um, a couple years went by, and I was at this uh, concert, a Santana concert in Missoula, Montana, and I bump into this guy, and it's Jonathan, and we start talking, um, and it turns out that he had been working for a couple years as a wildlife biologist in Montana and in Alberta for the Craighead Institute. And then the next year he joined me as a co-instructor for the next two seasons leading university field studies programs in Southern Utah. Um, during all this time when he was an, on an, an undergraduate on the field studies course, when he was co-teaching with me, I was always struck by his ability to sort of ask questions that went deep, beyond sort of the superficial. He was always questioning the orthodoxy of ecology. Um, and some of his insights going back to the 90s have remained with me and in many ways sort of informed my direction and my research and some of the questions that I've had over the last 20 years or so. Um, a few years after that, Jonathan enrolled in a PhD program in botany at the University of Wisconsin. Oh, this was after he hiked the Continental Divide Trail from Mexico to Canada with his wife. And how many grizzly bears did you encounter? Six, eight. <laughs> um, so since 2008, he's been at Western State University, where he's now the professor of environment and sustainability and biology, teaching undergraduates and graduate students. For 30 years, um, almost 30 years, 27 years, if it would be accurate. Um, we've shared a lot of adventures together from rafting the Grand Canyon to academic conferences. And I'm always amazed by sort of his insights, delighted by his sense of humor, um, 
and it gives me great pleasure to introduce my good friend, Dr. Jonathan Coop. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Awesome, well, th thank you so much, uh, Greg, for the introduction. Thanks, um, Gonzaga, it's great to be here. Um, it's great to be out in the Northwest for a little bit where it's nice and balmy and warm compared to Gunnison, Colorado. Um, and thanks to the uh, Center for um, Climate S Society and the Environment for hosting this and the Environmental Studies. And yeah, thanks again, Greg, for the invite. And as, um, as poetic and kind as your introduction was, there's a lot of, of really probably stories that shouldn't be shared and things like that, you know, um, or, or shared over beers or things like that. And if you guys want some insight on Greg, I'm happy to share some of those stories with you guys too. Uh, but yeah, we certainly had some, some fun adventures. And yeah, all right, so I'll go ahead and get started here. <coughs> the theme of this evening's presentation is changing climate fire regimes and the future of Western North American forests. Um, I'm focusing a lot on the Southwest where I grew up and where I'm from and where I do a lot of work. Um, but there's a lot of parallels and some stuff that kind of is, is true across the Western US as well as what, what we're increasingly concerned about globally with many of our um, forested systems, particularly boreal and temperate forests. Um, yeah, and this will be a little bit of kind of a standard academ academic presentation with me just kind of talking about a lot of the work that I do and that I would do with colleagues and some stuff that I'll highlight some stuff that colleagues are doing. But at the same time, this is the stuff that we're trying to get out in front of the land managers and in front of society generally as we kind of take a front row view of what climate change has in store for our forests. Um, and it's not always a pretty story, as I'm sure you're aware. So <clears throat> yeah, thanks again. All right, so I got three themes that I'll touch on here. First of all, wildfire under current and future climate. Um, some new, new stuff we're doing there. Uh, and then sort of the outcomes of this, some of these changes in terms of our uh, effects we're seeing in our forested landscapes. And then some thoughts on rethinking maybe how we manage these systems and maybe a little more broadly where we'll, how we think about conservation um, and our interactions with these ecosystems moving forward. So, all right, I'm gonna start with uh, this shot here this is in, from the uh, NASA um, uh, satellite imagery of the East Troublesome Fire, which burned in Colorado um, in October of 2020. Um, and we'll return to this fire here in a few minutes. But um, I probably don't have to tell you guys this, but what we're seeing in terms of fire behavior, especially over the last couple of years, is shocking even those of us who are in the scientific community who are studying this stuff and modeling like we're seeing things that are like oh my god this is actually happening and things are changing in a way that are you know pretty dramatic right um, just this last year in Oct October 3rd or December 30th um, you may have heard about these fires that happened in the Colorado Front Range and swept through um, a couple there are two different fires but basically swept through a, one one town over a thousand homes burned to the ground um, in just uh, basically within a single uh, single day uh, Marshall fires. And this was at the end of December in Colorado, right? Um, so, you know, yet, yet, yet another one of these like um, kind of shocking examples that maybe we even start to get numb to. Um, I was talking to these guys about the Malden fire that occurred here or just south of Spokane um, last year and, you know, similar kind of thing. It's you know, it's one thing when it's out in the woods, but when it comes into our communities, uh, suddenly things get real in a, in a really big way, right? So I also probably don't have to tell you about the fact that it's getting warmer out there, but it really is. Um, and of course, last year, you all got to experience the heat dome. Um, I just got to sort of enjoy reading about it online from Colorado. Um, but just to r remind you, you know, Record high temperatures set across the Northwest. Um, looks like Spokane was one of those places that beat its pr prior record high. And what about this poor town of Lytton, British Columbia, 121 degrees, which is basically, you know, hot Death Valley. You know, that, that's a hot day even in Death Valley. Um, and then, this, then it, this town burned to the ground the very next day. Um, so 
a pretty, uh, pretty clear exemplar of, of um, the consequences, the immediate social and human costs of some of, these, some of these changes we're talking about. We're getting pretty good as a scientific community in terms of actually attributing particular events to climate change, whereas before, you know, we might say like, well, we can't really say was climate change the driving force behind, you know, this hurricane or this particular weather event. Um, they've developed a lot of means of these climate attribution studies actually saying like, well, how much was this event influenced by climate change? Or how much um, could we expect these kinds of events in a warmer future, right? And um, I just want to point out that this heat dome event was um, a one in every thousand year event under a sort of normal climate, but was, would be expected to occur every five to 10 years um, in a 2C uh, world of, a uh, 2C um, warming, warmed future, right? Which is, uh, well, slightly under four degrees Fahrenheit on average globally. And that's certainly where we seem to be headed right now as far as maybe even that would be a desirable outcome rather than some of the warmer ones that we might, that we might um, be charging into. All right, over the last <coughs> several years, uh, we've, we've come to a really pretty good understanding scientifically as far as the, the vast majority of evidence linking increasing wildfire activity with warmer and drier conditions, right? So we're seeing more wildfire activity across the Western US and across most of the, you know, much of North America. Um, so there are really strong trends there. Our records in this, these cases often only go back to 1984, um, but certainly we're seeing, uh, you know, statistically significant increases there. Um, these changes are linked to drier conditions, um, longer growing, longer fire seasons, right? Even if the probability of fire is the same on any given day, if you have a fire season that's a month longer on either end, over that season, you're more likely to have fires occur. Um, and then the big driver is fuel aridity. So the drier it is, the easier it is to burn things. And the hotter it is, the more moisture evaporates out of fuels and the you know, vegetation and the, the biome generally, um, and the more likely we are to have fire, right? <laughs> it's just like when you make a campfire, it's easier to make one with dry wood than it is with wet wood, right? And not only are we seeing more fire, but we're seeing more severe fire, um, which is kind of where the concerns are ecologically, right? Um, okay, so this is some, some new work that we're exploring right now, but we're noticing that recent years have been sort of characterized not only by more area burn, but these really extreme single day events. And so lots of observations of these fires burning huge areas in just a very short, short amount of time. So as, as some examples of that, the August complex in California, you may have heard of that in 2020. It was the first quote unquote giga fire of, uh, recorded in, in North America, Western North America, or I should say the Western US of over a million acres. Um, and it cooked off about 50 hectares over, which is 125,000 acres, let's just say over about a three day period in September. Um, Lion's Head Fire in Oregon also burned over 100,000 acres over a, you know, basically a two day period. In 2020, this holiday farm, um, and within, by its second day, it was already well, well over 100,000. We used to think 100,000 acres was a big fire. That was called a mega fire. Um, and we're seeing those kinds of events happening, you know, in just over, within a single day in some cases. Um, so again, here, this graph on the left shows area burned and that's increasing since 1984, um, but we're also seeing more of these really crazy events. So um, this is what woke, kind of was a wake up call for me. This was the East Troublesome Fire that I mentioned before. This was in uh, Colorado. This burned right, right basically across the Continental Divide in Colorado. This is high elevation um, Rocky Mountain Forest. Um, it basically kicked off and burned over 120,000 acres in less than a 24 hour period over most of that overnight at high elevation in Colorado in, in near the end of October, which is when we don't even think we would be even having a fire season um, in this part of the in this part of the world. <clears throat> so we kind of, you know, I got wondering like, well, how crazy was that really? Is this because it seems really crazy. Um, compared to, you know, what are, what's like the normal sort of distribution of fire spread over 24 hour period. 
how important are these kinds of events when we think about cumulative fire effects overall, so overall area burn, and then what's the relationship between these kinds of events and climate, right? We a lot of times think about these kinds of events, oh, it was a crazy wind-driven fire, and we think about immediate weather at the time it was burning, but what about just big picture climate? Is that influencing these kinds of events as well? So uh, to answer this question, uh, uh, me and some colleagues, including Sean Parks, who I'm citing there, um, put together these day of burning maps. So we basically can use satellite, in, satellite observations of fire detections, interpolate those detections at any given time and kind of drop a perimeter around where the, where the fire is and then track over, you know, every time these satellites pass over, which is, um, you know, twice, a day, twice every day, we can see where that fire, you know, where those detections are, you know, 12, six hours later, 12 hours later, and then track the, where that boundary of that fire is spreading. So these are the kinds of maps you end up with. Here's the holiday farm uh, uh, map that I showed you before. And then this is another big fire in Colorado, the Cameron Peak Fire, that also made a really big run in that October um, time, time frame, October 2020. So this is the distribution of all these single, single day spread events. This is log scaled on the x-axis. Um, but you can see basically, well, we've got thousands of events that we've recorded in this data set. And you know, sort of uh, peaks, in, peaks around you know, uh, maybe 100, 200 um, hectares per day being like an average rate of spread for a fire. So maybe a little less than 500, 500 acres per day being average rate of spread. Um, but then this kind of tail out here, are you even seeing this little, uh, I don't think so. But this tail out here on the far right where we've kind of got these extreme events um, stacked up here. So uh, the answer was, well, that East Troublesome run was actually pretty crazy. It was the seventh largest run that we had recorded in this database. But still, that means there were six that were bigger than that, um, including some really, um, really um, extreme events uh, in, in California. So <clears throat> 100,000 acres overnight or in a single day is pretty extreme. Um, but there's even been a few more that are more extreme than that. How important are these events in aggregate fire effects? Um, so to do that, I just, I'm plotting cumulative area burned on the other y-axis there. And you can basically see that um, this is the red lines basically tracking, adding up all the area burned underneath those white lines. And all these smaller events down here don't really make that much difference in terms of their contribution to the total area burned. But what we're calling extreme events, greater than 1,100 hectares, um, right on 2,500 acres. Um, so greater than one standard deviation from the mean account for about 70% of the area burned. The top 10% of single day fire events account for almost 60% of the area burned. And this is really crazy. Just the top 1% of these events actually account for 20% of the area burned. <clears throat> so these things are, are super important in, in sort of setting um, air, total area burn and these trends of increasing fire, um, increasing area burn over time. All right, our next question was, do these events relate to climate? And basically we, we pulled out a lot of different interpolated climate data. There's tons of really great climate data that are available um, these days. Um, you can just download these really, these really huge climate data sets and basically, um, I'll kind of skip what all these graphics mean here, but the answer is yes, these are correlation coefficients down here. Um, and basically, yes, the warmer and drier it is, we've got three different metrics here of, of climate moisture deficit, maximum temperature, and this thing called vapor pressure deficit, which is kind of like how, how much power the air has to suck moisture out of fuels and vegetation. All of these things are great predictors of how many extreme events we, we get in any given year. So it's not just wind or weather or local conditions, but when you have dry climate and you have dry, long dry summers, you get these kinds of extreme events occurring, all right? Um, so the answer to that question was yes, and then we modeled forward under projected future climate. Again, we're just using this two degrees Celsius warming scenario. This is relative to pre-industrial conditions. So we've already achieved one degree Celsius of that warming. We're halfway there. Um, and we can model forward and look at what kinds of fire behavior or fire activity we might see under this future climate. And 
Um, this top gra left graph is showing you uh, the uh, current or reference period, which is um, basically um, approximately the last 20 years. The reference period versus future for some of these metrics of atmosphere, climate moisture deficit, temperature, vapor pressure deficit, um, and then aridity. The red dot is 2020. So you can see that in, in many of these cases, 2020, which was kind of this extreme year, is actually pretty representative of what the future climate might look like. And as far as number of extreme events um, and area burned, um, 2020 is the sort of thing that we would expect maybe one out of every four years to look like under this two degrees C warming scenario. So the take home message there is um, we could certainly expect increasing numbers of these kinds of events under sort of average conditions in the future. But the other one is the extremes in the future are likely to far exceed any of the extremes we've witnessed so far. So not only should we be prepared for more years that look like 2020 um, as far as wildfire activity, temperature, et cetera, but brace ourselves for those really extreme years that we haven't even seen yet and the kinds of um, fire activity they're likely to bring. All right, so that was the first part and I, I'm probably not telling you anything that you aren't already sort of aware of or thinking about, but I think the, the, the um, thing that concerns me a lot as a, as a forest ecologist is what are the outcomes of these changes on our forested systems. Um, and so we're gonna sort of zoom into this area here where I grew up, the Jemez Mountains in Northern New Mexico um, and talk about some studies that we've done down there, which I think kind of exemplify the kinds of changes that we're seeing increasingly unfolding across a lot of our forested landscapes. I don't know if you can quite see from where, you're, where you are at, but you know, the, in the Southwest especially, the mountain ranges tend to look blue because and they're sort of coming out of this brown desert and sticking up into the sky and that blue is all those conifers, right? Around here, a lot of the landscape looks blue from a distance because you guys have a lot of conifer trees, but they're really distinct in the Southwest where you have these kind of brown deserts with these blue mountain ranges rising out of them. But one thing about the Hamas is, you know, every time I go back there, it's like, well, there's a little bit less blue. They're, they're turning more and more brown from a distance. And that's basically all this area that used to be conifer forest that is not conifer forest anymore. And I'm, I'm kind of becoming acutely aware of like, oh, we're, Maybe this is just a, you know, a way of kind of saying this is like, well, we're kind of losing our blue mountains, um, particularly in the Southwest. So just to go take a step back, resilience is defined as the capacity of a system to absorb change and recover. And we've sort of have this paradigm um, of resilience around fire. Like you've probably seen stuff like this. Well, we have a forest um, with a little, you know, Bambi in it and it grows and maybe it kind of reaches some equilibrium and then it burns down, but the trees grow back and over time we have a new forest again, right? And this is kind of a paradigm in ecology, right? This, these successional processes will lead us approximately back to where we began, you know, given enough time and essentially the same climate and disturbance conditions as occurred prior to that fire, right? Um, this is a fire that I experienced when I was a kid. Um, that was me, approximately 1977. There's my sister. She was kind of bored. Um, she doesn't work on forest ecology. I was geeking out with the binos. This is a picture my dad took from our backyard of the La Mesa fire, um, which was burning in the Jemez Mountains, burned about 11,000 acres um, in 1977. And we went back and we were doing some research out there and these landscapes. This is from a photo from 2006, but you know, I'd kind of been spending a lot of time out in these landscapes as I grew up. And you really don't see much sign that a forest is coming back in this particular setting. You can see that there was there, there were some dead you know, snags and things, but there's not a lot of recovery of this particular forest. In fact, this was one of the study sites that was featured in this paper that really started a lot of this research how resilient are southwestern ponderosa pine forests after crown fires? And it turns out they're not very resilient to, to crown fire, right? And we know that historically, these forests experienced lots of fire 
We know that from these fire scar records where fires damaged trees and left a scar but didn't kill them and they survived these fires. And there's sites where you might find a, a fire scarred tree that recorded 30 different fires, right? Over, you know, just maybe a 200 year period, right? So there were lots and lots of fires in these landscapes. Um, because these trees were very, you know, thick bark. S same thing with the ponderosa pine here. They're very fire resistant trees. And here's the fire scar record from the Jemez Mounds. Each one of those vertical hash marks is a fire recorded by a fire scar tree. And that all came to an end around 1900 with the onset of contemporary, you know, um, Anglo-American land use, which was heavy livestock grazing that removed all the grass. And now there's no more surface fire because that was what was burning. All right. There's, there's a, probably, you've probably seen time series photos like this, but basically here's the change from this open ponderous pine forest into, you know, what it looked like in 1989. And yeah, this is a lot more flammable than that one, right? <clears throat> okay. La Mesa turned out to be the first of a series of fires that started burning in this mountain range. Um, La Mesa was actually on the small side compared to what came. And this is just a graphic uh, showing basically where each, we're just mapping the composition of vegetation in each of these um, samples. Um, and you don't really have to, to, to I, don't, I, I don't probably have to explain it too much, but basically where we have forests, these are areas that didn't have fire and everywhere else was kind of turning into these non-forested systems like that picture I just showed. In 2011, we had another fire. This was called the Los Conchas fire. Um, this is not a low severity fire either. Um, and it burned about 140,000 acres. This fire um, made a really big run, uh, about 40,000 acres overnight. It's, or during its first afternoon and night, it was burning about an acre every second for about um, almost, well, for about 14 hours it was burning, a rate of an acre a second as it made its, its really big run at first. All right, so it turned out less conscious fire reburned a lot of these areas that had been previously impacted by these high severity fires. And you can actually see here it is where it reburned the dome fire. And these white lines are just white ash where there was a dead tree that had fallen over, that was killed by the previous fire, and then it just burned down to white ash. Same as what you might get on your you know, wood burning stove or your campfire when all is said and done. Um, so it, it kind of sparked our question. It was like, well, how did the vegetation respond to that subsequent fire, uh, especially that vegetation that had been created by these earlier fires? This is just showing the lost conscious footprint compared to all those other fires. The Cerro Grande fire in 2000 was another kind of notorious fire that burned, uh, it was a prescribed fire that got out of control and burned into the town of Los Alamos there. All right, so I'll show you these graphics and then I'll show you some pictures that'll explain it more than these do. But basically the arrows represent where the, how much each plot, each sample changed. And so anywhere that was forest when the lost conscious fire rolled around changed a lot and kind of moved into one of these other vegetation types meadows or this weedy vegetation or this oak scrub. But those ones didn't really change as much. Oak scrub in particular, where it, this was a fire generated vegetation type that when it burned again, basically it stayed oak scrub. Whereas the forest got, you know, turned into that other stuff. So just to show you some pictures to illustrate this, here's this forest in 2006. There it is after the less conscious fire, right? So basically, you know, toast. Um, here's one of our weedy ruderal plots. It's kind of this spiny shrub called Robinia neomexicana and some non-native grass. There it is in 2006. This is about 10 years after it burned initially. And there it is in 2014. It's almost hard to tell there was ever a forest there anymore. Here's some of that oak scrub I was talking about. So this area burned also in the 1990s and then it reburned in 2011. Again, if it wasn't for these last few snags you would probably never really even think there was ever a forest here. Whereas, you know, just 20 years before, this was a ponderosa pine forest. Okay. So, uh, you know, personally, watching these changes unfold um, was a little, it's a little bit uh, dramatic, I guess. Um, 
But my question was like, well, is this, is this just something that's happening here where I grew up and I'm just you know, watching this landscape undergo these amazing contortions and changes? Or is this something that's happening like across multiple, across different kinds of forests and different kinds of landscapes? So we brought together this group of over 20 researchers working on forest and fire ecology across Western North America, including some people who are working way up in Canada, and sort of developed this little model of like, well, what would it take to change a forest into something else, right? And the first thing is, you basically, this is the way we might measure that ecological distance is on the x-axis there. Um, low distance means it hasn't changed. If it's high distance, it's very different from what it was before, right? <laughs> so we, we might have a situation where we have a fire, but nothing changes, right? Like in the old days with those low severity fires in the ponderous pine forest, right? It might change a lot. Um, but the kind of standard paradigm would be, like, well, that's a resilient system. It'll go back to where it was. Um, but if you overcome that initial resistance so you can have a severe fire, and then something gets in the way of those resilience mechanisms, like, well, there's no more tree seedlings germinating. Trees aren't sending out their seeds, or their seeds aren't germinating and growing into baby trees. Well, you've lost the resilience of that system. It's not going to recover and bounce back. And that's where we end up in this trajectory of it's either going to be something else for a long time, or it's going to be something else, you know, essentially forever. We don't know because we've only been watching these systems for you know, a few decades. So we're not going to say, oh, it's never going to come back. But for all intents and purposes, it's not coming back anytime soon. And in the time frames that we care about, which is like our lifetimes, our children's lifetimes, time frames in which managers have to make plans, don't plan on this forest to come back. This isn't going to be you know, board feed of lumber for centuries, if not millennia, if not ever, right? OK. So what overcomes resistance? Severe fire. And we know that's associated with changing land use, and it's associated with climate change, right? Um, OK, what are the things that get in the way of those recovery or resilience mechanisms? Well, one, one is really big patches. So if you have a really large patch that doesn't have a single tree in it, there's no seed sources for that stuff, for those trees to come back in there and regenerate, right? For ponderosa pine, how hard is it going to be for a seed from way over here? This is wind dispersed. It's not serotonous. Basically, you have to have mature trees with cones that open up, and the seeds are going to blow out here in the wind. So those seeds are going to have a hard time making it more than 50, 100 yards from the seed source. If you have a patch that's way out here that's a half a mile or a mile from the nearest seed source, it's really unlikely that that forest is going to recover there, right? Over any sort of time frame, in the short term, maybe you could think, well, over m many generations of trees, you know, they'll grow out here, and then it'll become a seed source 50 years later, and maybe it'll get some seeds out there. But the longer we have these big patches sitting there, the more time climate's going to change, and the less likely that the climate at that spot is going to resemble the, the climate that ponderosa pine needs to grow. <clears throat> Another issue that we're seeing is reburning. So up in the boreal forest, or the high elevation forest around here, we have lodgepole pine in the boreal forest, a lot of jack pine and black spruce. These trees are actually really well adapted to severe fire. They have serotonous cones that only open up when they get heated up by a fire, right? And so we think, hey, this is a system that should do well with high severity fire. But once you have the, those tree seedlings growing, they might need 20 or 30 or 40 years before they're going to get large enough to start making seeds of their own. And so the frequency of fire up there, as that frequency increases, we're losing the capacity of these systems to regenerate and recover to what they were before. And then the big one is climatic constraints. And basically, tree seedlings appear to be particularly sensitive to climate, more so than adult trees. And so as you increase the temperature and the aridity of these sites, um, you know, maybe the adult trees can persist, but the seedlings just aren't going to get reestablished. In some cases, we know that, for, for example, in the southwest or in the northern you know, Rockies, it, it's only, you're only going to get really good regeneration under cooler and wetter years, but those years are becoming less and less frequent, right? So the actual conditions that you need, they may still occur, but they're not going to occur nearly as often. And at some point, those conditions aren't going to occur anymore at this site, right? And you're not going to be able to have those trees getting reestablished. Because the tree's climate niche has moved on. It's, it's higher elevation now. It's somewhere else. It's higher latitude, right? 
the same conditions that these trees grew up under no longer occur here. <coughs> this is a study that uh, colleague Kim Davis at the University of Montana is leading up right now. And we're basically modeling combined effects of increasing fire severity and warming across the Western US. Just want to point out, this is, this is data that from many, many different researchers, almost 10,000 different plots that people have gone out and counted tree seedlings in these different forest types across the, across the Western US. Um, and basically modeling forward, um, blue colors are where you're gonna have forest recovery, red colors, it's really unlikely. And you can see there's two different scenarios. One is a low severity fire scenario. Even under that scenario, we're already seeing a lot of places in the Southwest turning red. Um, you, you know, in our recent timeframes, that only becomes more pronounced in the future. Um, uh, and of course, under a high severity scenario, where we have those really large patches and conditions are even less, less favorable for tree regeneration, a lot more area in the Southwest, in the Sierras, a lot of Colorado is going to become increasingly hostile for post-fire tree regeneration. So we're more likely when we do have fires that are severe for these systems to not be able to bounce back. And then finally, I'll just mention one other kind of interesting process that is at work in some of these areas in which you, once it burns, um, it changes the vegetation in a way that becomes more flammable. And so a great example is from parts of the um, West Coast where like here in the Siskiyou Mountains or the Klamath Mountains of, of Oregon and California um, where the first fire basically kills a lot of trees and, and creates habitat for this re-sprouting, cha these chaparral, these really flammable shrubs. And then the, that stuff is super flammable. Now we've got a lot of dead trees or wood that doesn't have any fuel moisture in it and this ultra flammable chaparral. So now you're more likely to have fire than you were back when you had a forest. So these are the kinds of changes that could amplify or create, you know, these are, we consider these positive feedbacks that can make, once you get these changes occurring, they're more likely to stay. <clears throat> Conversely, there's negative feedbacks. So in some cases you burn down the forest and you remove a lot of fuels, it's unlikely to burn again, or it shifts to a forest type like aspen that may be less flammable. In that case, we would expect reduced fire activity. This is where there's a lot of uncertainty. This is always the case with a lot of these biophysical models where we have feedbacks, it becomes a lot harder to make predictions until we really have a sense of how strong those feedbacks are and how well they work and whether or not even they can be overcome by extreme burning conditions and things like that. So there's quite a bit of uncertainty, but the take home is increasingly, we, we are no longer confident that when you have these wildfires burning, especially high severity fires um, that create large patches, where we really can't be confident those forests are just gonna bounce back the way they, they once did. And um, that's likely to only become more and more of an issue under future climate. All right, I wanna change, uh, uh, locations briefly because one thing I've been learning is this isn't just an issue here in Western North America. These are the Ghat Mountains in Southern India. Anyone been down there? Um, really incredible tropical dry forest. This is, this is the BRT Hills Tiger Reserve here. And this is one of these areas where you can't just go hike around out there because there are lots and lots of leopards and tigers. It's actually a dangerous place. <laughs> it's actually a dangerous place to go. And elephants are dangerous as well, it turns out. Um, but this is the habitat. So this is a big tiger reserve in India um, set aside to conserve these, you know, large, um, you know, large, beautiful animals, right? But there, um, there's a bit of an issue. And if the forests are filling up with this shrub um, which is really changing the structure of the forest and also kind of creating ladder fuels that now when we're getting fires there, they're spreading into the canopy and, and creating changes that are unexpected um, in this system. And this is the shrub, one of the, one of the main shrubs is called lantana, it's a non-native shrub and it's kind of become a big pest in a lot of tropical dry forests. Um, but what it's doing there is leading to high levels of fuels and now when we're seeing forest fires there, um, these fires are burning at unchar uncharacteristic severity um, in terms of getting up into the canopies of these trees um, where people are seeing fires and they're not really used to like 
Well, these fires don't aren't supposed to be burning the forest down, right? All right. Also, I just want to point out it's not just fire that's a concern. Um, bark beetles are also have also been blowing up across much of the much of Western North America, parts of Europe, Asia, um, over the last several decades. And bark beetles also change forest composition really dramatically. Um, in many cases, you still have young trees in there that can regenerate and replace the forest that was there over time. But in some cases, we're also seeing shifts from one forest type to another associated with these beetle outbreaks. And then finally, um, it turns out that drought itself, just drought by itself, even without sort of the, um, without the things that it triggers like fire and beetles, drought itself where it's severe enough to kill forests is also capable of driving these long-term shifts in vegetation from one forest type to another or towards a non-forest type. So this is a colleague of mine, Enrique Bayori, who's uh, in Spain. And this is another one of these papers that has many, many authors, different data sets from all around the world. But he, found, he basically put together 131 different sites where drought had, had killed the mature forest canopies. And the dominant tree species was recovering in 21% of those sites. Um, that's this green, it's self-replacement here. Um, this color green up here is replacement by different species of trees. And then here we've got some of these other alternate um, uh, outcomes, uh, replacements by shrubs in 29% um, of sites, and then shifts into entirely non-woody, you know, grassy vegetation, in another 10% of these drought killed forests globally. This is mostly boreal and temperate forests. So we, we didn't really get into these super diverse tropical rainforests, um, but there's certainly lots of impacts of drought and climate change um, in those forests as well. But it's, um, they're not nearly as well understood um, just because those forests are really complicated. All right, okay. And so um, just one other thing I'll, I'll talk about real briefly. We put this survey together and sent it out to researchers and managers across the Western US. And we sort of were like, well, is this a concern? Are you guys seeing this where you're working? If so, like, what are the things that might be causing it? And we, got, we had 300 responses from, again, this is a lot of you know, foresters or um, someone who might be a range specialist for the BLM or you know, it could be an academic researcher or a research forestry researcher with the Forest Service. But basically, of that 300 responses, there were only seven who said, no, this isn't something I'm concerned about or seeing where I'm working. Um, and fire and climate were, were the big, big drivers there. Non-native species was another one that I didn't really touch on, uh, maybe in that example from India. but. A big concern out here in, is, is cheatgrass and some of these other invasive grasses that really have the capacity to alter sagebrush ecosystems. Um, that's also happening. It's multiple different invasive species of, of oftentimes annual grasses that are um, taking over in some of these shrub systems like sagebrush, changing the fire regime because they're so, they're these, they basically produce so much ultra dry flashy fuel and then when you get fires, they tend to regenerate really well. So it's definitely something people are reporting and seeing across a lot of areas. All right, so that's, that's kind of where we're at with our understanding of the capacity of climate and fire to drive major changes in our forested systems. Um, and uh, now I'll talk a little bit about maybe some new thoughts on land management and maybe how we need to be thinking about some of this stuff um, as we move forward. All right, so uh, this is from the latest IPCC uh, report from last summer. And I just wanna point out that, you know, let's see here, we're still down here, right? So we've, we've achieved about one degree Celsius or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit of warming, on average, globally so far. Of course, that's, we're, we're seeing more than that. If you, if you live inside a continent, it's more than that. And if you live at high latitudes, it's more than that. Um, but uh, we're still down there. 
we still have, you know, even under the most optimistic case, we still have a ways to go. Um, and under more pessimistic scenarios, we've got a long ways to go before we come to some sort of new climate equilibrium. Um, and so in the meantime, we can expect quite a bit of change coming. So there's two points to this. One is change is certain, it's coming, right? I, I'm hopeful that we have the capacity to mitigate some of that and maybe get ourselves on a slightly more sustainable path here. Um, the other point is there's a lot of uncertainty in those estimates because the one thing no one really can predict well is human behavior, right? And so societal response, if you could, you could make a lot of money, right? Um, but you, it's, it's really difficult. And then um, also I wanna point out that it's gonna be different in different places. Like how much warming we get in any given place and how that translates in terms of evapotranspiration um, and you know, extreme events, uh, is gonna, it's gonna be place specific. But again, there's a lot of uncertainty there. All right, and so how, how should we be responding? Well, if you are a student of land management policy or environmental history, um, you know, it probably wouldn't be that much of an overgeneralization to say that sustaining things as they are is really the foundation of uh, forest management or natural resource management here in, in the US and Canada as well, right? Um, if foresters decide to go clear cut some mountain range, they're gonna replant that same species, a lot of times using the same local genotype of tree that was there before to try and grow it back to the same forest type. Does that make sense? So sustaining things as they are, where they are, is really the premise of much of our land management philosophy. And that was great philosophy in the 1950s, right? Or when you know, we first started developing our management paradigms and we were realizing, oh, we're, we're doing all these dreadful things to these landscapes, inadvertently losing you know, wildlife habitat and wildlife species on fisheries and forests. Um, just sustaining what was there, made it, that was a huge improvement over no policy at all, at all right? Um, but now we're at a point where it appears that a lot of change is inevitable. And like I said, major ecological transformations are now underway. And we can really anticipate, given everything we know about their causes, that they're only likely to accelerate in the future. So this is a really um, cool paper um, by these guys, Greg Apple and David Cole. Uh, it's a book chapter from 2010, but basically they, they put sort of um, land management and ecological condition on these two different axes and came up with like these four different um, kind of pathways of how a system might change over time depending on its degree of human control. So um, whether it, you know, let's say we have a new ecological condition that's highly controlled, we would call that transformation. A pristine ecological condition that's also highly controlled, we can maybe a system we might restore it to try and go back to this pristine state. Um, alternately, we might just allow things to unfold as they will without control. That might be back towards its pristine original condition or it might be towards some novel state, right? <clears throat> under, under global change, uh, maybe recovery back to a pristine condition is not really likely. And so they came up with sort of three different options, accepting change, guiding change, or resisting change, right? Where, where a resisting change is sort of our paradigm, maybe there's some other options that we need to be thinking about. And subsequently, this has been sort of rethought and retooled a little bit. And uh, Gregor Sherman, a colleague of mine and a really great guy, um, and some of his, his colleagues are putting it forth as this resist, accept, direct, framework, um, basically, do you wanna shape the trajectory of change? If not, well, we're just gonna accept this is how things are changing and this is how things are gonna be, whatever happens, happens, right? Um, accept should be a deliberate decision though. It shouldn't just be like, well, we don't have time or money or nobody cares, so let's just, things are, but no, rather, we should say, actually, we're just gonna, there's maybe it's designated wilderness and it's really far from anywhere and it's hard, it costs tons of money to go in there um, and do anything. Well, we'll probably just accept we have other priorities for where we intervene, right? And then 
alternates. Alternately, we can manage for historical conditions or a new condition, right? And so we're, we're used to that resistance paradigm. Let's try and get things back the way they were. But in a future of certain change, it may be unfeasible or impossible to get things back to the way they were or the way we want them. And so then we might have to think about some alternates, like maybe, maybe we can't have a ponderous pine forest here in, under a future climate, but we could have some other kind of forest. It's not the one we're used to, though. Um, and this is where we get into sort of maybe some um, kind of new conundrums about how, how, we make, how, we do, how we make these decisions. All right, a couple more points, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to some questions. But I'll just go back to my beloved Jemez mountain range in, the, in northern New Mexico. And under this theme of resisting change, we made some maps showing like where are the forests left? And we're working a lot with this concept of refugia as being habitats that maybe are going to somehow or other escape some of the changes that we're seeing. Maybe it's like a cool canyon bottom that's unlikely to burn, and it's more likely to sustain uh, the same forest that were there historically because it's a little buffered from climate change because it's cooler, it's more mesic, right? So we're really interested in what are the places on the landscape? What's that spatial pattern of highly vulnerable to more likely to persist um, and kind of using this refuge, this idea of refugia as a lens we can look at landscapes and say, okay, well, here are some places where things are still there. Here are some places where these forests persisted through multiple extreme fires, right? Um, and it turns out if we can identify refugia um, and we can, we can think about managing for these places, we might really want to think about this is where we really want to resist change because these are the, that's the only place that's the only tree squirrel habitat left on this landscape. Like, I always tell people, that's the most important tree on this landscape. Well, it's the only tree. So yeah, thus it is the most important. But, it, but don't ignore it, don't forget about it. Don't say this area is all, it's all been wiped off the map by fire because this tree is producing seeds and there's new trees being generated. So these are the places from which, you know, um, resilience may, you know, spring back onto these landscapes. All right. And then one other study we did, we actually went and looked at some places where they had done some prescribed fire prior to the Los Conscious fire. This graph, this axis is burn severity here. And basically where we had prescribed fire, um, especially where we had one of those older wildfires and prescribed fire, those places burned at the lowest severity. And those are the places where a lot of, those are some of the places where ponderosa pine forest persisted even in, even sort of in the teeth of one of these extreme mega fires. Um, there are places where the forest escaped and it was largely because we'd gone in there and lit some, lit some fuels off before this fire came by, right? So if you wanna remove fuels that a fire is gonna burn, well, fire is a really good way to do that because fire knows which fuels fire wants to burn, right? Okay, I'll just a shout out to some of the great work that's taking place up here in the Northwest. Um, these guys like Derek Churchill and Paul Hesburgh and Susan Pritchard are, do, have done lots and lots of work looking at restoration of inland Pacific Northwest forests. And we have a lot of ideas about how um, these forests could be managed to restore their historical structure, composition, and the ecological process of fire, right? So fine scale heterogeneity, landscape mosaics, patchiness, but areas that have really open canopy structure keeping those large fire resistant trees, reducing surface fuel. These are all things we know we can do to help these forests persist. Um, what's coming, whether it's arrived yet or not, right? And ultimately the goal would be to allow fire to come back and do its historical thing and not just cook these things off the map, right? Um, but then we come to like accepting or directing change, right? We know how to resist change. We don't know how successful we can be. Um, in a, in a two degrees Celsius warmer uh, on a global average conditions with more extreme fire. But we have a lot of strategies. But under what conditions might we want to allow changes just to unfold, right? <clears throat> um, maybe where they might be desirable or otherwise just unavoidable. Um, here's, a pot, here's a conifer forest that's kind of been converted all into like young aspens. Maybe that's a place where, hey, it's a native species, it's a tree, it's actually less flammable than what was there before. Maybe that's a positive change, right? 
Um, where do we want to direct systems towards some new state? What states are possible? What's our capacity to even create these outcomes? This is where we don't really know. And there's a lot of opportunity for both science and also sort of society and management to start to, to think about these questions. And I think we're ob obligated to think about that as well as like who should make these decisions? Is it just like scientists and managers? Or, you know, it's public forest, right? It's public land. It's like um, a lot of it, at least here. And then, you know, it's, it's future generations that are going to be um, living with whatever the consequences of whatever decisions we make, right? And this is my last kind of question for you all is like, are we really ethically prepared to be making these kinds of decisions about transforming global ecosystems? I mean, we're doing it. Um, but are we really ethically ready to start making these kinds of decisions with really lasting ecological and social consequences? So you might know of Aldo Leopold, um, who's kind of this formative environmental ethicist and wildlife biologist and all sorts of other great things. But um, in Sand County Almanac, he talks about um, this land ethic, you know, it's, it's what's good, sort of a thing is good if it, if it tends to preserve the integrity and stability and beauty, right? Um, but are those the words that we need to guide us in this time of change, right? Maybe that was a good ethic then, but, you know, stability is out the window. Integrity is, is, you know, who even knows how to define that? And beauty, of course, is in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, so maybe we need to be thinking a little more broadly. And I'll just, I want to just talk about this tree for one minute. Uh, my last day when I was in India, we went, we stopped the car and with some of our, some of our colleagues and we were like, we're, they're, just, they're just like, come down here and come see this. I didn't even really understand what we were going to go look at, but it was this tree um, that's also one of the temples of the Solega people who live in the hills, in the BRT hills. So there's like indigenous community who've been living in these hills for, you know, according to their traditions, thousands of years. Um, and instead of having, you know, temp India is full of, Asia is full of these really amazing temples, but their temples are actually the trees um, themselves. <clears throat> and this guy, um, I got to meet him. He is one of the elders of this Soliga community, Achuga Gauda. And we were talking about what kinds of changes were happening in these forests and the concerns about fire and things like that. <clears throat> and basically what he told me was, you know, these people lived in this forest until they were basically forced out in order for it to become a tiger reserve. And every year, their tradition was they would burn everything that was flammable. Basically, every year, they would go around and light things on fire during the dry season. And so, yeah, like, why does the forest look like that now? Well, because we removed the people who were creating that open structure and removing all those fuels year after year after year. And now they were kind of stuck into these towns, and they um, basically are no, lo no longer allowed to practice their traditional fire, fire management. And so, yeah, well, it's no wonder the, this forest looks nothing like what it might have looked like um, historically. I would also, you know, question, like, is this really good tiger and elephant and leopard habitat or not? It's, it's, it's pretty uh, hard to even walk around in that stuff. All right. So I'd just like to end with this quote by the Senegalese um, forester, conservationist, Bao Yum. In the end, we'll conserve only what we love. We'll love only what we understand. Um, this is a really just neat pine tree in Spain that was cut by some vandals and then all this work to keep this one, um, one beautiful pine um, upright and alive. So um, lots, of lots of collaborators, um, just a few, uh, Sean Parks, Meg Kracha, Camille Stevens Room, and Sandra Hare that I want to give kind of a special shout out to. But all this work is, is lots and lots of researchers working really hard to try and figure out all this stuff. And yeah, if there's maybe a few minutes for questions, I'm happy to entertain a few. I don't know if anything's come in on the uh, come in on the email. We're also going to do an experiment. We're going to try and use ESP to sense what questions anyone who's streaming this video has, and we'll try and uh, sense what they are and um, respond to those accordingly. Greg's going to be responsible for that. He's the he's the man with the phone and the extrasensory perception. Let's thank Dr. Coop first <laughs> as we're getting ready. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, and we'll run a microphone over to you. Yeah, so I wanted to ask about the uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
direct step of that rad model you were showing us. Uh-huh. Um, if we can look at the uh, Yellowstone fires in uh, 19 um, of the 88, is um, how would sort of the uh, parks servicing, the park service managing in a uh, uh, directing way look for Okay, so I'll just flip back here. Model. Can you re repeat the question? Yeah, I'm going to... I'm going to do my best here. So you're asking, like, when we think about this concept of directing change, are you asking for, like, how, how, are the, how is, like, the land management agencies responding to that? Yes, how would that look like? Yeah, and what would it look like, right? This is a really good question. And I'll point out two things. First of all, uh, Gregor actually works for the Park Service. This is just from last year, and they published some new articles this year presenting this framework essentially. Um, but it's very, it's emerging as like, okay, it's, it's easy to wrap your head around, it's rad. Okay, that's kind of fun. Um, and it's, it's a very simple breakdown of our options, but it's new, right? And I would say that we're used to resisting, we're used to accepting just because maybe in some areas we don't have any resources or choices, but directing is kind of a new thing, right? So maybe an example of directing change would be like in British Columbia where they might be logging a forest and then planting like southern species or southern genotypes when they replant that forest. And the forestry sector up there has been particularly um, maybe proactive in terms of planning for future climate change. So that might be one way, right? Um, where we're thinking about, well, hey, we, we may not be able to grow this forest type again, but we have another one that works, right? So we're talking the Southwest, like there's some pines in Mexico that are really well adapted to severe fire. They re-sprout and they're really well adapted to drought. Like, should we be bringing those things up and planting them in some of our landscapes where they didn't occur before, but might be really good at the, in the future? Does that make sense? And so we're not doing this on a really broad scale, um, but we are starting to experiment with these ideas, right? And I think maybe that's the first step is like, well, let's test it out. Let's not mess it all. Let's not mess it all up and do something that's even worse than what we were trying to solve. But, but let's start experimenting with these ideas. So, I guess the first thought would be like having kind of management research partnerships where we're like everything we do, everything land managers do is an experiment. But at least let's gain some knowledge from it, and maybe we can try some of these ideas. Right? Um, like, if you guys heard of like the American chestnut, it was this tree, this amazing tree that occurred across the eastern North America. It was formed these huge forests, right? And it was lost to this disease called the chestnut blight. Well, what if we can genetically breed, you know, use, use genetic engineering to breed a, a blight resistant chestnut? That would be another example of, um, well, I guess that's kind of directing and resisting at the same time. It's trying to get the same thing back. But yeah, this is a new idea. Essentially, this is a relatively new challenge to the dominant paradigm of resisting. And under, you know, I think there's going to be a lot that we have to figure out before we start saying, well, let's just go you know, plant this or that or try something new here. Um, I think it'll have to be done in a deliberate way and hopefully with good participation and buy-in you know, from society um, so it's not just on the shoulders of some land managers or scientists to try and make these decisions. Yeah, thanks. Others? I was just curious, like, how you're going to deal with public resistance to switching over to direct in terms of, like, even, like, prescribed berms or what you're talking about bringing in, like, new species. What do you say to people who are, like, having a fear of fire or fear of new species coming in and, like, switching over from that resistance kind of? Yeah, well, it's a good question. And as I was talking to Greg earlier and kind of joking, well, it's easy to be a scientist, like it's hard to do science. <laughs> and, but it's easy to be like, well, here's, here you go society, here you go land managers, you know, here you go young people, here's some information, now you decide what to do with it. But yeah, what um, are the, what, uh, what would be like good means of having public engagement? And I mean, I, I don't know the answer, but I would say like, we need to be involving as many people as we can in the inland management and conservation decisions as we move forward. And at least that way we'll say, well, we put our best foot forward and we're we might be trying new things. 
but you know, people were engaged with that process. But how do you overcome resistance? I don't know, it's super difficult, right? Um, you know, there are people who don't think we should have any, they don't think we should allow any managed fires to burn, right? Sometimes we have fires burning under moderate conditions or benign weather, and we say, well, let's just let those fires go. They're gonna go do good work and redo, remove fuels right now, right? Um, without any threat to community safety, right? But there might be people who think, well, we shouldn't even do that, right? Um, so it's really, it is challenging, super challenging. And you know, I kind of asked this question about like, ethically, are we ready? I mean, we're the people who are allowing climate change to proceed right now, right? I don't think future generations are gonna look back at us and remember anything about what we did other than, well, we changed the climate. That might be a little pessimistic, but yeah. Um, I was just gonna ask, you talked about the idea of refugias and places where we want to focus our protection efforts or resistance efforts. Uh -huh. um, how are those places generally identified um, and in terms of protection, is that usually work with whoever already owns the land? Is it attaining possession of the land and uh, you know, more scientifically directed management of it? How has um, identifying and maintaining those refugias like interacted with, I guess, the social and policy side so far? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And I guess I'll offer the caveat that like, most of the work that I do and most of the stuff I'm talking about, we're talking about public land. We're talking about forest service, BLM, park service, state forestry, right? Um, and so, you know, most of these ideas and these studies, we're, we're applying them to, you know, land that we all own, that's like all of ours, right? Um, and the idea with the refugia is, it's probably you know, gonna be futile to try and keep everything the way it is. Well, it will be futile to, to apply this resistance mentality across the board, right? There's places that are going to change, right? And so maybe we need to be really prioritizing where do we apply, like where are the places that are really valuable that we really wanna keep things the way they are, right? And there, there we get into human values and ethics, right? Like I really love this species and I'll do whatever I can to keep it on the landscape, right? Um, or why? Because, because, yeah, it's hard to explain why, right? Um, or I really like, you know, this landscape the way it was and I want it to stay that way. Well, but we can look at areas where we say, well, here's where it's more likely that those efforts will be, will, will be fruitful, right? So it's a kind of a way of thinking about how we prioritize things. And, you know, maybe it's we find these areas in fires, we can say, here are the places that are less likely to burn severely. Here's the places where, you know, we can help keep those for us on the landscape for longer because we have a sense of what the, what the climate is like at those sites and because we have a sense of what fuels are like or how fires likely move through those sites. But yeah, most of this stuff is just, we're talking about public lands, right? In some cases, you know, might be working with like an organization like the Nature Conservancy or, but right, for private landowners, I mean, you know, if, if people are interested in this kind of stuff on private lands, then yeah, come and like, I'm sure there'll be researchers who are excited to like help work with, work with you, but no one's, you know, we don't have any sort of grand strategy <laughs> for how to do everything everywhere, just the places where we do have those options and where there's public investment in those processes. Um, that was obviously given to us as like a reflection question, but as we think about like what it means to be ethically prepared um, to make sort of those major decisions that you were talking about, what do you think we still lack, if anything, in terms of ethical preparedness to, I don't know, make the lasting ecological decisions that you kind of prompted us to think about? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, some of you are probably EMVS students, you're probably taking environmental ethics classes, right? So like an ethical framework that brings in the more than human or non-human as something that we value in a particular way, I mean, we, we have to be able to think beyond our own species boundary, right? I think we're perhaps more challenged in how short-sighted we are in terms of our temporal framework. Like, evolution prepared us to be really good at, you know, 
experiencing, you know, a sudden rush of adrenaline if there's a predator next nearby, right? Like Greg was joking about these grizzly bears. You're out in the woods and you come in contact with a grizzly bear, like, oh my God, you're gonna do something, right? Maybe it's just you're gonna freeze and try and, you know, but it, we're not necessarily instinctively prepared to respond to something, hey, in a hundred years, this, all this, all this stuff's gonna be, you know, coming, like, it's like the kid, you saw the, you see the tsunami video and the, all the water disappears from the ocean and everyone's like, oh, I'll just go walk out there. And, oh, there's this giant wave coming, get off the beach, right? We're just maybe not quite prepared. So I would say like some sort of intergenerational ethic seems to be what we're lacking. The effects of climate change are probably gonna last, some estimates are about 10,000 years, right? So we're talking, let's just say 400 human generations, like, it's hard to even think beyond our own day to day or our own generation, right? You know, people talk about like the seventh generation is like this ethical framework that some of the Iroquois might have had, right? So something like that, I think, we seem to be missing right now. I don't know how, I don't know how you foment an intergenerational environmental ethic, but I think we kind of need something a little, a little, some way of thinking beyond our own, our own generation right now. How about that? All right. Um, well, that was sort of a, a great question and a great comment to sort of um, wrap up the presentation. Um, Jonathan's happy to stick around here for a few minutes. If people have more questions, we can answer them. And uh, with that, um, please round of applause for a great presentation. All right, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, stick around if you want to ask me a question.